Sewing jackets is the topic for this current mini-series. Notice I said sewing jackets, not tailoring jackets, since the term tailoring can cause a feeling of dread in some minds. The person responsible for changing the way we make jackets is my guest, Patty Palmer of Palmer Pletch. Patty, during the first program we worked with fusibles, and now it's time for speed sewing. Yes, and Nancy remembered that I said that once you've made a jacket, mm -hmm. all of your other fashion sewing will be easier. You'll be better at pressing, trimming, it'll look better, it'll fit better because of the time you spend learning this. So now we're going to learn quick lining, which is sewing a jacket out of the lining and the facing and upper collar, and then we have their, our main jacket. We'll sew them together and I'll share some techniques on how to make that easy. Jackets for real people, that's what's coming up next on Sewing with Nancy. Sewing with Nancy, TV's longest airing sewing and quilting program with Nancy Zeman is made possible by Baby Lock, a complete line of sewing, quilting, and embroidery machines and sergers. Baby Lock, for the love of sewing. Madeira, specializing in embroidery, quilting, and special effect threads because creativity is never black and white. Koala Studios, fine sewing furniture custom built in America. Clover, makers of sewing, knitting, quilting, and embroidery products for over 25 years. Experience the Clover difference. Amazing designs and Class A needles. Our goal in this program, Jackets for Real People, is for you to have the tools that you need, the encouragement to, need to create a lined tailor jacket. Yes. And the first part, a lot of it is cutting, shaping, and fitting. And that's what we did in the first program. And now we're going to be creating a lining unit and... The sleeve and mm -hmm. the collar unit. <laughs> the jacket unit. Previously on Sewing with Nancy, if you were with us the last time... I was. <laughs> yes, you were. Uh, we created this unit. and. We did all the fusing, we did the pin fitting, and now it'd be time to do the sewing after it's fit correctly, sew right sides together, the shoulders, side seams, darts, etc. And try it on again and get a quick fit because it doesn't uh -huh. matter how many try sure. times you try it on, there's no rule for that. And then you're going to create the unit. So we have the jacket unit and here's another one, Patty, mm -hmm. the jacket unit and it's almost ready to go. Yeah, my, my friend Marta did this and she loves machine embroidery so she added that touch before she finished the jacket. So the, then the lining unit, which I'm pulling up here, has the facing mm -hmm. and of course the lining pieces. Now if you... I just noticed something interesting. I think Marta must have run out of that copper <laughs> lining, and I, you're never going to see it, so what a great yeah, idea. Yeah, use use uh, two pieces, that's right. Uh, so now if your jacket had collars, you'd put the upper collar on the lining unit mm -hmm. and the under and collar the on, the on the jacket unit, and then we're going to tell you a little hint about the under collar. Yeah, usually you have to shape the under collar to make it roll, but we're going to do a quick shaping technique, and I have placed the pattern piece back on the under collar and where the roll line is marked I'm just going to go through and mark it right on the interfacing because this will penetrate the pattern. So now I'm going to go and sew on that line and show you how to make a quick roll. The machine is set at a 1.0 millimeter stitch length and here you can see Patty stitching and pulling the fabric on either side of the presser foot. And as you pull away from the roll line the roll line gets smaller and shorter, so as you use small stitches to grab it, it actually makes the whole roll line shorter, which ends up in an interesting look. Here is the collar, the entire collar that has been stitched, and it, it may look odd to you at this point, right? It does. It just kind of gathers. It and looks terrible, but watch what happens when you roll it. It just automatically folds beautifully. So normally you'd have to put it around your neck, sure. I mean the ham, the, and make the pin it and steam it like mm -hmm. we did before the under collar or the upper collar. And this way it's just shaped with that easing stitch. So you would attach the under collar to the jacket unit and we have half samples here, half jackets. Here is the lining unit as you can see and here we have the upper collar attached. Here is the sample that shows the under collar with that ease stitching around the st collar stand. Now there's a really important 
part to match where you st start your stitching. And you have the under collar, Patty, and I have the pattern piece yes. for the jacket. And let's just reference that because this is the all important dot. Remember when we were marking the neckline on the interfacing, we marked the dot very carefully because that dot and the dot on the collar are sewn together and that's what makes your V for your notch. And we're going to show you how to do that. And another thing you can do at this point is you can decide if you want to have some fun with your lining. And oh, if you've sure. run yeah. out like Marta might have done, you <laughs> might have gone to your stash and seen if you had a, a pretty print. You also could sew a piping to the lining. That's fun, isn't it? Yes, it's so when you take off your jacket, oh, you have this nice little accent. like it. Sew it to the facing first with a basing stitch, and then it just stays there when you sew your lining to the facings. Mm -hmm. If we go back to those collars, when you're starting to sew the collar to the unit, whatever piece it is, you will match it right at that dot. And we can have, you're going to secure that stitch mm -hmm. so that there's not going to be that sewn exactly one-on-one. -on -one. You're going to have a seam allowance so that we can sew the lapel. Quick press will do us a lot of good. Pressing the neckline seam open, use press over a tailor board or whatever you'd like to use, a hand perhaps, and Patty, you want to press that. Just yeah. I can finger press or we'd, we'd use some steam to press this open. You'd repeat on the lining unit that has the upper collar. Soon we're going to sew the jacket and the lining unit together, but first let's set in the sleeves. The collars have been sewn to the respective units, and now, Patty, it's time to look at the sleeves, as we mentioned. And one of your easy tailoring techniques is to add a beautiful vent. With a mitered corner. And the mitered corner, you see, is in this area, so there aren't any raw edges on any side of this. So we need a little change, perhaps, on the pattern piece. Yeah, um, the, this is a pattern piece that's a two-piece sleeve, mm -hmm. which you need but we need to add the vent because this one didn't have a vent. So we've added a piece of tissue about two inches uh, from this, the Stitching seam line. Mm -hmm. and about five inches long, but it can be however long you want. You can have a vent up to here if you want to do something <laughs> really different with 10 buttons. No problem, whatever you want to do. But you do that to the under sleeve as well. So on the outer sides you have the extensions added and mm -hmm. then you're going to add some fusible interfacing and do some pressing. Yeah, it's always nice in a jacket to have some interfacing in the hem area mm -hmm. because it does give it a lot of body and more durability. And I've extended the bias pieces just a little bit beyond the fold line as well because that makes the lower edge much more durable. So now I'm going to press under the interfaced vent and then press un up the hem line. Now the easiest way to make the miter is to go ahead and just make a nice snip right where the two come together, the vent and the hem. And I make a pretty deep snip so I really can find where they go. And what I want to happen is I want to fold my snips together to this little corner. So I'm going to do it on the outside. I find that easier to do that first. And there's my snip and there's my snip. So where the snips are, I'm going to just put a pin. And then I'll put one more pin all the way to the point, and that's where my seam is going to be. But then, so I'll know when I unpin and go to the wrong side, I'm going to cut a perfect eyeball, <laughs> one quarter inch seam allowance. A perfect eyeball. And then? And then from the wrong side, you're going to sew a quarter inch seam. And then when you turn that after you press it open, and I just would like you to use a point presser to okay. press it open. Shh. Make believe. Yeah, make believe. <laughs> that's quick. OK. And then when you turn it, you have Oops, mm -hmm. a perfect miter in that hem. And then you would do the same on the other. We have the other well, corner. The other edge is, you don't need to miter. Just you just right sides together, do a quarter inch seam and turn it and press it. And then we'll sew the side seams together. And that's what we had on the sample that we showed you. It has the miter on the outer side and that seam just perfectly stitched. I, it's really a very unique way. And you know something else you can do, quick tip, you can actually hem the sleeve when it's totally flat. Mm -hmm. And that's much easier than hemming in a circle. Sure, great idea. You notice we didn't clean finish any edges. The fabrics can be a little ravelly, but it's going mm -hmm. to be all encased in lining. So mm -hmm. not to worry, your fabric is going to look much like ours. Now, before setting in the sleeve, we're going to add some fullness to the cap. 
And Patty has some samples here that show the importance of this step. Yeah, and on, on my jacket, you can pretty well see that my um, sleeve cap looks like it has something filling it, mm -hmm. and that makes it less puckery, and it's what designers would do. And we used to use tie inter a bias strip of tie interfacing, and you can't get that anymore unless you take apart one of your husband's ties. Um, but you just need a bias strip of something that's loosely woven and sort of lofty, but I like to use self-fabric whenever I can. So the first sample I made, I just made a little sleeve cap, and I sewed a bias strip of self-fabric, but it didn't, wasn't lofty enough. It was a little bit harder finish than I like. So I took my fashion fabric, and I had another, I had a few things in yeah, my stash. Had, I, had I this, think you have more than a few, Patty. I had a few, Yeah, mm -hmm. I have a few things in my stash. So it's easy, just go to your fabric. So I found this one, and it's very soft, but it was a little bit too heavy. I could see it on the outside. And then I found one that was a little bit softer, but not quite so thick, this and it was just perfect. This is a yummy wool. Yes. It? it feels mm -hmm. like cashmere. And it's loosely woven, so it has a lot of give to it. So when I sew it to the top of the sleeve, it will pull, and when it's let go, we will um, ease it up. Now here's how you go about this, and we're going to show this to you at the sewing machine. So Patty, you have a strip of... I have a strip of fabric, and I'm just going to, first of all, so you've got to get it started. So put your needle down in and sew a couple stitches. And now I want to sew for sure five-eighths of an inch away from the sleeve cap. So I'm going to be pulling on my bias. Now it will get narrower, but forget that. Just follow the edge of the sleeve. And sew a ways, pull, sew a ways, pull, sew a ways, pull, until you go around the two-thirds of the upper cap. Then you're done. And you will find that if you pull hard enough, it will ease in the cap for you. You don't need additional easing stitches. And here is the sample that you saw earlier, and you can see how that sleeve head is stretched, and that gives the fullness. It will stretch out the extra fullness in the cap. It will help ease in the sleeve. Let's just show it to you from the what will be the right side. And you can just see how that sleeve is, mm -hmm. is shaping. It's just a very fine technique. And it makes it much easier to set the sleeve in without doing rows of gathering. Now, we have set in many sleeves on Sewing with Nancy. Use your favorite sleeve easing or set in sleeve technique. Mm -hmm. Set the, of course, the garment sleeves into the garment unit, the jacket unit, and do the same to set in the sleeves and the lining. Obviously, you don't need the sleeve yeah. head in the lining. Your two units will be ready, and now it's truly time to sew the outer edges together. During these two episodes of Jackets for Real People, we're giving you the highlights of putting together a jacket, the tailoring, the speed tailoring ideas, and we've saved the best highlight for the last. And Patty, that highlight is to sew the lapel, the jacket lapel, the collar, to meet at that four corners, like an intersection. It is. It's a, it's a little tricky intersection, and what we used to do that really didn't work very well is we would sew up the front of the jacket to that little the dot that we would talk about earlier, where they all come together, and then we'd go back and forth, back and forth, closing up that hole, and then we'd stitch around the collar, the other one, and all the way down the other front of the jacket. And we got a beautiful pucker right there. So <laughs> for years, we had that problem. So then finally we decided, you know, I bet if we start at that little dot, and sew away from it, when you sew around the collar as well as around the, or down the front of the jacket, that you won't have that happen. So right here where we have the dot, which we marked when we were marking the neckline and everything, we've sewn the collar to the facing and we've backstitched right out the dot. Now we're gonna start about a sixteenth of an inch away from the last stitching. And we will lower the needle in to where we want it by hand, and then we will lower the presser foot. So you're not stitching any seam allowances down, any catching no, any of the... No, got everything out of, out of the, the way, way. except mm -hmm. the upper collar and the under collar starting right at the mm -hmm. dot, thank you. And then we're using a regular stitch length here, and notice I didn't even back stitch. Sometimes I'll pull a thread through and tie it, but it's actually not necessary, it sort of buries itself, but it's up to you. So we're sewing toward the point of the collar, and when you have bulkier fabrics, you should uh, do a couple stitches across the point, but I always go to a shorter stitch length as I stitch toward the point so I can trim closely. And when I get to where I want to go, I leave the needle down, presser foot goes up, I go to an angle, and I do two short stitches across the point. You will, it'll look like a point when you trim it and turn it. 
So we go, come back and I'm going to leave those, the machine set to small stitches for a few stitches. And then I'm going to go to a longer stitch length, back to where I was, 2.5, and continue stitching. I would go to the center of the collar and then I would start on the edge, other edge of the collar at the notch and go toward the center again. So I'm going to stop here for now. So raise the pressure sure. foot, cut my thread first here. And as Patty is cutting the thread, you start from that intersection, that four-way stop intersection at the lapel point. So to the collar point to the center. Then you'd flip it, sew the other half of the collar. And now it's time for the lapel. Nancy, I first want to point out that I had a, a pin here with a little pinch. We call that a tailor's blister, and it takes that extra large upper collar out of the way of my mm -hmm. stitching, so it makes it a lot easier. And I've got one on the other side, too, for the lapel, upper lapel, but I'm going to be sewing from the other side so you won't be able to see it. So again, we're going to flip all the seams out of the way, and we're going to start just away from the original stitching at the circle, and we're going to sew to the point, a couple stitches across the point and down. So I will put this under, and again, I will lower the needle by hand to, so it's where I want it. And then we'll lower the presser foot and start stitching. And when I get to the corner, or almost to the corner, I'm going to change it to a shorter stitch length. And a few stitches into the corner, I'm going to lift the presser foot, pivot, and I'm going to do two stitches across the point. If I were doing a blouse collar, I'd only do one stitch because it's uh, very lightweight. Pivot again, a few short stitches beyond the corner so I can trim closely, and then I'm going to go back to a longer stitch and stitch the rest of the way down the jacket. Now I can trim pretty close and not have any problems with it um, coming apart or raveling out. Mm -hmm. Also, the fusible interfacings certainly ensure that you're not going to ravel as right, well. Right, sure. Okay. So getting that intersection, that lapel point, starting at the lapel point without catching any of the seam allowances, prior sewn seam allowances, is what's going to keep or achieve a perfect lapel. And now it's time to do some trimming. Earlier we did the pressing of the under collar seam or the upper collar seam and then on the upper collar. Now we'll do some trimming, in which I started to do already. And just trim off so that you've graded the seam allowances. One, is, one are longer than the other. And here's that intersection, that four away stop. And Patty, you've given me the okay that I can have a little opening in here. It's called the hole that follows the dot. <laughs> And it's okay. <laughs> it is okay. And then we'll do some pressing using a pr tailor board or pressing point, whatever you'd like to use. Place the collar seam over the top. And there are small little pieces in here. Just take your time. This is what's going to separate the people who have followed the instructions and people who haven't because here we go we're just pressing it open you can if you have this a, a pressing tool like this you can do some finger pressing at first and then just give a little shot of steam now you'll be pressing probably standing up at your ironing board and we're making it convenient here right at the sewing machine but now you'll be having a full jacket. I just have a half a jacket for the sample, but I'll show you what happens. We'll tr invert these. And the proof will be in the pudding here, Patty. We'll see how I did on this sample. Even if the hole ends up an eighth of an inch big, don't worry about it. Okay, I'm not going to worry about it. And Better than a pucker. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and it will be top stitched and pressed, but here is, there's just a slight little opening in there. But after doing some top pressing, you can see that, that now that the lapel point, all those four intersections came out to meet perfectly. And no pucker. And no pucker. <laughs> there are certainly many more steps to creating a jacket, but Patty and I have gone over the basics, the highlights of creating a jacket. You'll have some work with attaching the two collars together along the roll or the neckline, attaching the lining unit together at the shoulder seams, putting in the shoulder seams and doing some hand stitching. But all in all, we've given the highlights of making a jacket for us real people.
Colorful patchwork quilts are nothing new to most of us who sew and quilt, but instead of being made of fabric, picture these quilts created with over 100,000 glorious blooms. Now that's something truly unique. Here to tell us about the quilt gardens along the Heritage Trail is Sonia Nash, Travel and Trade Marketing Manager for Elkhart County, Indiana. Sonia joins us via Skype. Welcome to Sewing with Nancy, Sonia. Thank you, Nancy. It's great to be here. This is something that I've been have on my bucket list to see. <laughs> Nineteen beautiful gardens in the rolling hills of Indiana. Tell us about it. Oh, it's just breathtaking. And for four months, beginning on May the 30th of every year, all the way up to October 1st, we have 19 giant gardens coming to life in quilt patterns with using 100,000 plants. <laughs> uh, they're just breathtaking. And they're located in seven communities all along a scenic driving tour called the Heritage Trail. And we're located in northern Indiana. Visitors and guests, quilters and gardeners are coming by the thousands to enjoy and watch and view these gardens come to life. Now these gardens, as, as we've talked earlier, have a, a planning stage. It, it just doesn't happen by chance, of course. That is true. Each garden has to select their own pattern and their own design. And not every quilt pattern will replicate itself very well into a garden. Imagine uh, the beautiful quilt behind me by Shirley Shank from Quilt Designs at the Old Bag Factory in Goshen. Imagine that complicated pattern coming to life in plants. Well, Shirley is a fiber artist and she does have a quilt garden in Goshen uh, that she does interpret and creates into this visual beauty. So it's just inspiring for all people to come and enjoy. And it's not just blooms, it's, it's plants as well because it, they're pretty in the spring, summer and fall. Oh, definitely. What's unique about this project is as, as annuals, they continually change as mm -hmm. the season and cycles grow. So the pattern really changes. Uh, even though it may look like a double wedding ring or a log cabin quilt initially, uh, that design will look very different in May as it's just planted as it does in August. Uh, so it really reflects and depends upon the quilt uh, the design as well as the plants that are chosen. You know, many quilt shops are destination areas for those of us who sew and quilt, but I know that this is a destination to see these beautiful blooms in quilt patterns. Do you have any idea how many people kind of travel the trail during a season? Well, that's what is, is what is so unique about this area. Along this heritage trail, these quilt gardens are located at our magnet attractions, at some of our great restaurants, wonderful mm -hmm. shops, and yes, those fabric shops that people <laughs> love to go and see and enjoy are scattered throughout, and some, one at Das Dutchman Essen House in Middlebury, they feature a wonderful, beautiful quilt garden, and they have their own quilt fabric shop on the same site, uh, plus a wonderful country inn and family restaurant. So uh, this attraction is open and event is open year uh, for four months and it is open during all daylight hours so it's very challenging to communicate and count the number of people that are <laughs> sure. coming through sure. uh, because it's it's open at any time from morning to, to sundown you know one of the quilt uh, designs quilt gardens that I'm, I'm looking at has uh, quarter scale triangles and you know there's a specific technique in quilting to get those points to match but I can't imagine to make sure that all the flowers are blooming just perfectly at those angles. It, it must be a trick to know exactly how to plant. It is not only in planting, and we've created lots of different types of systems that the gardeners uh, throughout America really enjoy seeing and coming and watching, but also our quilters enjoy seeing those techniques in the Lemoyne Star, for example, that mm -hmm. was at Amish Acres, have that created and brought to life, or the circle shapes at the Wellfield Botanic Garden, uh, using that type of style brought to life in a, uh, an original design, um, but brought to life in plants is very challenging. Oftentimes it's taking 60 to 80 hours just mm. to create the design before they even plant one of the 6,000 plants in that garden. Oh, inspiring, inspiring. I, as I mentioned, I have it on my bucket list, the quilt gardens, and I'm sure now m many of our viewers are going to make a destination to Elkhart, Indiana, the county, to visit. Thank you so much for being with us, Sonia. I appreciate your time. It's, it's delightful. I can't wait to go. Well, thank you, Nancy. We encourage everyone to come and visit. I think they'll have a wonderful time. Uh -huh. uh, you can log on and get some information, but we'll be happy to help. 
And our viewers can go to nancyzeman.com, and at nancyzeman.com, and you click on Nancy's Corner, and then you'll be able to find the Quilt Gardens website and go there and find out how to take the tour. Thank you for joining us on Sewing with Nancy and for our second program, our final program on Jackets for Real People, another special thank you to Patty Palmer for being our guest. As always, you can go to nancyzeman.com, watch pr programs online, find out more information on sewing. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now. Patty Palmer has written a fully illustrated book entitled Jackets for Real People that serves as the reference for this two-part series. It's $17.99 plus shipping and handling. To order the book, call 800-336-8373 or visit our website at sewingwithnancy.com 2525. Order item number JRP, Jackets for Real People, credit card orders only. To pay by check or money order, call the number on the screen for details. Visit Nancy's website at nancyzeman.com to see additional episodes, Nancy's blog, and more. Sewing with Nancy, TV's longest airing sewing and quilting program with Nancy Zeman has been brought to you by Baby Lock, Madeira Threads, Koala Studios, Clover, Amazing Designs, and Class A Needles. Closed captioning funding provided by Rowenta. Sewing with Nancy is a co-production of Nancy Zeman Productions and Wisconsin Public Television.